Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share. It's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. Keep in mind everything that you need to know about photography. F-stop, shutter speed, lens selection. Nice photo, I've got beautiful light now. Oh my God. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. You know, as a wildlife photographer and an outdoor enthusiast, I really appreciate our forefathers who many years ago had the insight to set aside large tracts of public lands for national wildlife refuges and national parks. There they can preserve and manage our precious natural resources. This week I'm at a place that I've never photographed before, Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge right off the coast of Virginia. Please join me as I photograph the animals that call this place home. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. Well, I tell you, this has turned out to be a fantastic morning. You know, I didn't get what I really came in here to get, but you know what? I came out with an even better shot this morning. About, I'd say, 8 o'clock, we saw the Virginia Rail. And the light was absolutely gorgeous. Um, the sun's coming up to my right-hand side here, so I had beautiful side lighting. And he was just in and out of the, the tall grass here. He was feeding, and he was just sitting in the sun, just warming up, because it was very, very cold today. And then after a while, he got up and flew across the canal behind me here, and I thought that was gonna be the end of it. Well, a few minutes later, they flew back across. There was actually two of them, and landed in the grass and fed in and out some more. Gave us a few more opportunities. Well, the strangest thing happened, and I don't know why I find this strange, but um, he swam across the canal right here in front of me. And I guess I find that strange because wading birds don't have webbed feet, so you don't associate wading birds with an animal that, uh, that swims. And I've never seen a wading bird swim. I've seen great blue herons you know, standing belly deep in the water, but I've never actually seen one swim. This guy, he made short work of it. I mean, he was getting it across this canal. So um, I'm really jazzed about this. We were driving by this morning, coming into the refuge, and from the road we saw a deer shoot up here into the woods. Now, we're on a refuge and the deer are hunted here, so I don't know if this is gonna work out or not. It's extremely thick, it's very low light, 
And uh, so I'm just going to ease up in here. I don't know how spooky they are because traditionally they will be spooky in areas that are hunted. So we'll ease up in here and see if we can maybe get a shot. But it's mighty thick with briars and stuff. I'm not expecting a whole lot out of this, but we'll see how it plays out. Um, some people call these the Sika elk. This is a cute animal, really adorable, very small deer. They don't get but uh, at max about 75 pounds. Even though I've got a great subject, it is a horrible situation I'm shooting in. There's so much vines in the way and, uh, and the light is very low. We've got an overcast day and it's early morning. So it was just a nasty blue kind of dreary light that I'm trying to shoot in. But you know what, this could change if, I, if I'm able to stay with these guys. So much stuff to shoot through here. You really got to pick little holes and wait for the animal to possibly step into one of those little openings. But this is just not good. But it's not always about the picture, it's the outdoor experience, right? Now, these deer are not native to here. They're not supposed to be here. Back in the 19, early 1900s, around 1910, 1920, a private collector brought these deer over here from Asia. And eventually, he decided to give the deer to the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts kept them for a few years, and then it got so expensive for them to feed the, the little deer that they had to just eventually turn them loose. And so now, um, 100 years later, there, we still have uh, quite a good population here and they're thriving on their own. All right, there they go, they're gone. Well, they were pretty tolerant, but anyway, who knows, we may see some more deer um, as we are out and about on refuge this week. So let's keep going, you never know what we're gonna see. got a belted kingfisher right here on an old dead limb beside this canal and sometimes especially in a wildlife refuge this is the only way you can get a shot oh yeah nice and when you're shooting from a vehicle there's a lot of different ways you can support your equipment I like just simply rolling my window up high enough that it kind of wedges the lens between the top frame of the door and the top of the window and that really helps uh, stabilize. I've even been able to uh, video subjects with pretty good stability just by using that technique. Alright, well let's move on and see what else we can find. Alright, we've got a nice great egret here on the side of the road. He's backlit. This is a really, really pretty situation we've got here. And my exposure right now is 1 640th of a second shutter speed at an aperture of F4. And my ISO is at 100 because we've got plenty of light. And I'm, then I'm going to open up a full stop and maybe a stop and a third. So this is working out really nice. The bird looks like it's just glowing. Oh yeah. Okay, we got a bald eagle right here, same road, not far from the uh, kingfisher. Oh, yeah, he's sitting pretty still. Nice side lighting on him though, really nice. It would be nice if he was a little bit closer. We could get a lot more detail on his feathers, but you know, not a great opportunity, but uh, I'll take them all. All right, we got another really neat situation here. Got several comorants sitting right here on this old downfall. It's a old pine tree that's fallen over into this little canal. The comorant is a really cool bird if you look at the history of, of these birds. Back several centuries ago, the Chinese used to use these birds for fishing. They would actually take a metal ring and slide down over the bird's neck 
and then tie a string to the metal ring and hold on to the other end. They would send the bird out for whatever fish the, bir the bird could find and the bird would swallow the fish but the fish could not go all the way down its throat because of the metal ring. And then they would just make the bird regurgitate the fish and that's the way they caught fish. Uh, I don't think I'm going to eat a fish that was regurgitated by a comrade, but anyway, that's what they did. It's kind of cool though. In this situation right here, we got very low light, but then we have some shafts of bright sunlight. And you got to be careful in a situation like this because you can get into a high contrast area. So you want to select a bird that is either in full sun or in full shade with no bright spots in the background. I've only had to sit here a few minutes and you know already the sun's moving in and out and the trees are blowing around in the wind and so I've got the my light is changing uh, periodically which is gives me some really good opportunities because I have a variety of different moods. You want to use the lowest ISO you can get away with because as always I've said it a million times the higher you get that ISO the more digital noise becomes a problem and in low light that really um, intensifies the problem. So in this situation I've chose 1 500th of a second and uh, I'm using an aperture of f4 because the birds are pretty close to their background and I want to compress that scene and kind of blur. There's a lot of distracting twigs and branches in the background and I want to blur those out. I don't really want those in my image and my ISO is 640. So anytime you're dealing with birds that are in and around water you always want to try to get eye level to that bird. So you want to get as close to water level as possible. So I'm, right now I'm about 18 inches off the surface of the water. So I'm still getting that low level perspective, which is what you want. But the lower you can get, the better. All right. Well, this is looking good. Light's falling. I want to go ahead and take this opportunity to move out to an area that has a little brighter light. I can extend my shooting time. Who knows? Might find some deer. We might find some some other ducks sitting out in some of these open impoundments. So let's get out of here and see what else we can find. What we've got in front of us is about 200 willets. Really cool situation. Um, the lighting scenario here is backlight to side light because the birds are right out here in front of me and they keep going back and forth. So when they're in front of me, I'm actually shooting at backlight and as they come over here to the right just a little bit, then I'm getting more side light. Now, I've got my exposure set right now at 1 1250th of a second for my shutter speed so that I can stop that action. These guys are in a feeding frenzy. They're catching crabs, they're catching minnows, and they're just scurrying very fast back and forth and never standing still um, at all. They're constantly on the move. So uh, I want to make sure I have enough shutter speed to stop that action. Got to get those nice, sharp, tack sharp images and make sure I don't have any motion blur. Now, I'm also using, because they're out a little ways from me and they're small birds, I'm, I've added a 1.4 by converter to a 500 millimeter lens and I'm shooting a camera that has a uh, crop factor. So I've got a lot of power here, but that's what it takes to get a shot of these guys uh, out th at this distance. So now keep in mind, I've got a 1.4 by converter, so I'm losing the stop of light. So the uh, aperture that I'm going to use is f5.6. Now the lens by itself is an f4 lens, but I can't go that low because I have a converter on there. So 5.6 is, is the best I can do. And I want to shoot as wide open as I possibly can so I can get a really shallow depth of field. There's so many birds out here that my subject has always got other birds in the background. And I want to make sure that my subject stands out from the rest of them. I don't want them to all be in sharp focus. So I want my subject nice and sharp, and then I want everything in the background to be blurred out. That way it draws the viewer's attention to the subject and, and instead of having multiple subjects. And I've got bright sunlight, so my ISO is set at 250. The birds are moving so fast, it's really, really hard to manually follow focus uh, on these birds moving that quickly. So autofocus, what I'm doing is I'm actually just putting my sensor right on the bird's head and following them the best I can. And when the bird gives me a pose, either catches a fish or lifts his head up for a brief second or is interacting with some of the other birds, you want to look for those unique body postures 
uh, that's what adds interest to, to your photograph. And in a situation like this, I mean, most of the birds, they got their heads down, constantly feeding as they go. So you, you really got to shoot a lot to get a little here. Now, if you are able to get one bird by itself, then you can increase your depth of field by um, using a, a smaller f-stop like f8 or even f11. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you more depth of field with the actual subject. More of the subject will be in sharp focus, which gives you a little bit of forgiveness if you're a little bit off on, your, on where your sensor is, uh, is actually trying to track the bird. Ideally, you want the sensor on the bird's head. If it's close enough, if it's a much larger animal, on the eye. That's what you will always want in sharp focus. But, you know, if you're a little bit off when they're scurrying along and you're having trouble keeping that sensor on the head, the sensor may drift over and you, it may be actually focusing on the side of the body, which is slight difference in distance from the plane of the side of the head. So with that extra depth of field, you could really kind of uh, cheat a little bit and it gives you a lot more forgiveness in your focus. Now don't worry, if you don't have uh, a huge 500 or 600 millimeter lens, don't think that you can't get great photographs. And if you had a shorter lens, let's say a 100 or even a 200 millimeter lens, which a lot of cameras come with a stock lens around one or 200 millimeters, you can still get a very beautiful shot in this scenario of these birds. You just have to kind of change the way you think about the composition and the story you're trying to tell uh, in your final photograph. So your shorter lenses are going to have much more depth of field, meaning there's going to be more area that's in sharp focus at, a, at the same given f-stop. So in this scenario, if I were shooting, say, a 100 millimeter lens, I would look at this composition a little bit different. I would use the whole flock of the birds as my subject, and I would incorporate a little, a little bit of the scene that they're in. It shows the environment in which these birds are feeding in. You got this beautiful Spartina grass, and then you got the blue water out in front of them, and you know, you can do a lot of creative things by using the environment in the shot with your subjects. So looking at this as a, a flock shot with a scene would, uh, would be a really nice added touch. It is cold out here this morning, that's for sure. This, it's been cold this whole trip. We're right in the middle of that polar vortex that's pushing down across the entire United States right now. And uh, I tell you, even with the temperature, it's cold. But when you add the wind, it gets kind of brutal. One of the things I really like about refuges and national parks that are positioned along the, the coast, you generally have good opportunities for migratory waterfowl. Um, as far as ducks, mostly what I've been seeing is black ducks and mallards, and uh, we've seen a few pintails, not many. When you're working on a wildlife refuge, access is much more limited than in a national park, the places that you can go, the areas that are off limits. Um, and so, you know, I always try to get eye level to my subject. It makes a much more dramatic image. And with these mallards that keep swimming back and forth up this canal, I really need to be right down there on water level. But they don't want you in the canal for obvious reasons. And so the best I can do is I'm right here on the edge of this slope and it drops off right here in front of me straight into the water. So I'm, I'm about as low as I can get. I'm still about two and a half feet off the surface of the water. But by using a long lens and photographing the birds further out, that really will reduce that angle of view and give you um, that water level appearance that you're really looking for. So when you're working in locations like national parks and refuges where you have a lot of people, uh, it's not how well you work the animal and how stealthful you move in on the animal, it's how well you work the tourist. Um, when I came and sat down here, the ducks were sitting right out here in front of me. And 
as people came by on the road back here and joggers coming by, the birds moved on down. And I just sat here and waited. And as the birds congregated down on the other end of this canal, then all the tourists started stopping down there to look at them and take pictures. And of course, they're just gonna open the door of their car right there on the road and make all kind of racket. Well, what's gonna happen? The birds are either gonna get up and fly back down this way or just swim down this way. So that's what I chose to do and it's working like a charm. Um, they don't seem to be minding me because I've been sitting here quite a while now, but you know, you just kinda gotta work how the tourists are gonna make the animals move and use that to your advantage. We've got plenty of light this morning and so I'm able to take advantage of the best of all three worlds as far as shutter speed and aperture and ISO. I've got one sixteen hundredth of a second shutter speed and an aperture of f4.5 and an ISO of 200. So I don't have to worry about digital noise. I've got plenty of depth of field to make my subject pop out from its background and I've got plenty of shutter speed uh, in case these birds decide to take off I can get a nice flight shot or even a wing stretch. So this is really nice. Now one thing about all waterfowl, their feathers are iridescent in color. So what that means is as they turn their heads and their bodies at different angles to the light, you're gonna see the colors change and sometimes the, the colors will become very muted and then they can turn just a, ever so slightly into the sun and then those brilliant iridescent colors will, will be visible. So those are the type moments that I wait for. When I'm just shooting a bird on the water I wait till they turn, especially these beautiful green heads on these mallards. When they turn just right, I'm able to capture that beautiful green head. Now the ducks here that we're working with, these are definitely migratory ducks. Um, with experience of seeing quite a bit of waterfowl, I can tell that they're migratory waterfowl because their legs are that bright orange color and they have on their feathers on the side you can tell that they don't have what they people generally call uh, pin burn and pin burn just means that the birds don't fly a lot and so the end of the feathers get real raggy um, and, and jagged looking almost torn so these birds have very beautiful feathers and they keep those feathers straight because they fly a lot that's what straightens those feathers out so being that these are migratory birds, you know, I can't really hide here. The best I can do is just move slow, stay as low as I can, and, you know, just watch their body language. I love photographing waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans. And this place is a really good location to shoot all of those. They have snow geese, Canada geese, um, tundra swans, and a whole variety of, of ducks. Now this refuge, it was set aside in 1943, and it's a pretty good sized refuge, just 14,000 acres, and that consists of beach, dunes, marsh, and then the rest is maritime forest. And then there's also um, freshwater marsh areas or impoundments, where, which makes great habitat for wintering waterfowl. Um, the refuge has a variety of other animal species to photograph, everything from the deer, both whitetail and sitka, and you know, then you have raccoons and bobcats and all the things like that. I tell you, I've had an absolute ball this afternoon photographing the tundra swans, and we even saw a bald eagle sitting out here in, the, in this little impoundment. Had Canada geese and a variety of different ducks going back and forth. This is the kind of thing I really enjoy photographing. I tell you what, you can't come to Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge here on Assateague Island without going to see the wild ponies. So I'm going to head up to the north end of the island to see if I can uh, catch up with some of those horses and get a few shots there.
Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge, what a spectacular place it is. It truly is one of our precious natural resources. And I invite each and every one of you to come out and enjoy this place for yourself. More information about this week's show is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph. It's the outdoor experience. I'm your host, Doug Gardner. Thank you for joining me on another wild photo adventure. Yeah, the two little woody ducks. Yes, you did the two little woody ducks. As a nature photographer, hang on. set aside large tracks of lar lar tracks, not large, lar tracks, and uh, to set up national wildlife refuges and natural park, natural park. Gosh, refuges and natural parks, natural, national, not natural parks. To set up natural, gosh. I can't say that word. And by moving the sensor, then I'm able to keep the sensor right on the bird's head and I'm already in the rule of fur, furs. Yeah. It's cold, my knees are cold. I can't move. Old man, old man over there need help, y'all. Well, getting old sucks. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap, that's a wrap. That was fun, that was fun. Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share.